Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here along with Manny Hill returning to the show. And Manny, here's what I want to say to you is, uh, first of all, welcome back. Obviously we were together often throughout the regular season, but not going to do shows every single week during the off season with you. But I need to inform you of how many times that the chat has said, where is Manny? When is Manny coming back? <laughs> When are we going to hear Manny comment on Kirk Cousins joining the Atlanta Falcons? So I'm just going to leave you the floor. You've had some time to think about it. You've had a few days to stew over what has happened so far. And I want you to tell me how you're feeling right now about the Minnesota Vikings, your thoughts on Kirk choosing the Atlanta Falcons. People have not heard from you yet. They have heard way too much from me recently. So Fire away, Manny. How are you feeling? I I feel great about it because I think everybody wins in this situation in terms of, you know, Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings. Kirk, I think, gets everything he possibly could have wanted with a, a ginormous contract with a lot of guaranteed money, and he gets the no-trade clause. Shout out to Mike McCartney, who got that to get you know, part of the deal again. I mean, it's just a masterclass work of of uh, sports agency on the on the part of Mike McCartney. And congrats to Kirk getting getting that type of deal. And and the Falcons get you know a veteran quarterback who's been very productive and very good for a long time. And now they're in a position to really contend and and possibly make some noise in the playoffs uh, next year. And for the Vikings, this is great for them as well because. I think it, this allows them to really officially turn the page and and sort of pivot and go into a new direction um, and and really kind of focus on building something for the future to put themselves in a position to to contend for a long time, uh, depending on a lot of the moves that they make going forward. So I, I'm I'm ecstatic for for everybody, really, because it really feels like a, a win win situation for for everybody involved. And um, this week has been really exciting because this is the first time in quite a while that the Vikings have been able to just be really active in free agency and they have been and I really like a lot of the moves that they've made so far so this is this has been great it's been a lot of fun this week so I want you to contextualize something for me here with Kirk Cousins leaving the last six years and where it fits into your life watching Minnesota Vikings football because when it's me talking, I moved here in 2016 to cover the team for what was 1500 ESPN. So I know Vikings history, as you know, but I didn't live it here in the same way that you have. And when I bring on someone like Brian Murphy, he's a reporter. Murph is a hardcore reporter, just like me. Uh, Eric Eager, for example, is a football analyst as, as good as it gets. And Dane Mizutani, uh, whose uh, episode is going to run soon on the YouTube channel, is a reporter for the Pioneer Press. So there's a lot of sort of objective opinionists uh, and not necessarily someone in your shoes who grew up a Minnesota Vikings fan here with the roots as deep as it gets in this team. So I, I want you to sort of look at the history of this team, where the Kirk Cousins era sort of rests in your mind, what it sort of says, where it fits in and what it means to be moving on from it. Like, give me your Vikings fan, put that hat on and contextualize this for me in, in your mind. Yeah, in, in a lot of ways, I, I think, you know, the organization was run differently from, you know, from what we've seen from the last six years, but it, it kind of falls into, I think that same um, category of, you know, sort of that, towards the end of the Danny Green into the Mike Tice era, that sort of that six-year period there where saw some success, went to the playoffs a few times, but never really, um, you know, with the exception of, of uh, 2000, you know, with the 41 donut experience, there weren't really a lot of, you know, trips where it was like, trips to the playoffs where it was like, oh yeah, this team, this team is contending and this team is going to go on a, on a, on a deep run to the Super Bowl. towards the end of the Denny years, you know, they had a couple of really nice seasons, obviously. And I'm talking about like post 98. I mean, 98 was obviously very real, but 99, 2000, they were, they were contending, but you know, when you really look back on it, they didn't really have, you know, certainly didn't have the defense that was good enough 
to really get them um, into contention for a Super Bowl. And so when they transition into that Tice era, it was fun because it was Randy Moss, it was Dante Culpepper, but they were just kind of this middling 500 team, you know, and they were run very differently back then. This was pre, uh, you know, Ziggy and Mark Wolf taking over as owners. Um, you know, so this was the Red McCombs era. So it was run differently, but it was kind of the same sort of results where, you know, it was it was frustrating at times because it was like, man, if they just do this differently, if they just add this player on defense, everything can kind of come together with what they have. And the Kirk Cousins era is kind of very similar to that, where every year it was kind of like, well, if they just add this guy, if they just sign this guy, they go sign this guard, if they make a trade for this corner or they sign this guy, then they're going to have everything. Then it's going to be fine. Then everybody will be ready to go. It just never, never really happened. They just never really got into the position that I think so many people were wanting them to go into. So I think to to kind of compare, if if I could reflect back on my life, you know, I'm going to be 40 years old in a, in a month. And when I think about my lifetime, that's kind of the, the comparison of those two eras that are, I think, pretty similar. Um, obviously, different times, different players, different you know, management style uh, between the two times, but it it's in terms of just frustration and exciting times on occasion, they are, they're kind of, um, they're kind of on par with each other. You know, this is something that I've thought about quite a bit over the Kirk Cousins era is exactly what you just said about the fleeting, exciting times that they had uh, during this last six years where we can pinpoint the moments where there is a fervor that goes over the fan base. And because our jobs, when you and I were working in radio together, or now when we're seeing the chat, getting the emails, the DMS and so forth, where uh, we interact so much with the fans that I feel like we have a good finger on the pulse of what the feeling is generally overall. And there are only about a handful of times where you can say that something swept over the fan base, like this feeling of tremendous excitement, uh, even really since I've been here, but especially over the last six years. So I can even just off the top of my head, kind of come up with a number of them. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, Sam Bradford going five and oh, and then there's all that excitement or, you know, Case Keenum getting hot. Uh, in the the middle of the 2017 season and then the Minneapolis miracle, the day Kirk Cousins signed, there was very much that feeling. And even though we argued with fans up and down about whether it was a good idea to sign Kirk Cousins, the excitement level was there because the expectation was raised to be Super Bowl or bust. If you were naming a season like they did on the old NFL films, how they used to do that, it would have been Super Bowl or bust would have been the name of that season. And even when they had their up moments, 2019, they won a lot of games, but there always seemed to be around the corner, something really disappointing. So in 2019, they've got a chance to beat the Green Bay Packers at home and compete to win that division. And the Packers just stomp their faces in and roll over them. And then you're playing in the wild card game, but you win the wild card game in dramatic and greatly entertaining fashion. You spend the week talking about how you're one step away and then you just get your face smashed in again by the 49ers. And then it's sort of rinse and repeat uh, on different levels. You know, they get back in the playoff race in 2020 and in 2021 only to have disappointing games where they were let down. And 2022 was the last frontier of that where it was like, all right, well, they've, they're eight and one. They just beat the Buffalo Bills, and that was an excitement level like I think we had never seen with Kirk Cousins. Then the next week, they get smacked in the face again by the Dallas Cowboys. Everybody kind of realizes it's not really good enough, and the end result ends up being the end result. And then the ironic last moment of a great game against the Green Bay Packers. You're about to get back to 500 with Kirk playing his best ball of the season, and then he pops the Achilles. And the sort of stops and starts of maybe it will, no, it won't, but it could, no, it won't. And that's, that's how I'm going to remember it is every time we would play the sort of talk me into game where it works, then it eventually just kind of doesn't. And by the time we got to season six, 
it was like you had watched the Saw movie over and over again. <laughs> and it's the same torture for Vikings fans. And it's better, I think, to have a movie end up with a bad ending than it is to have a movie uh, ruined for you. And you already know what the ending is going to be. And that's what it really was with the Kirk Cousins era. But I will tell you something, Manny. One thing that I have never really truly been able to figure out that I have chased for so long with Kirk Cousins is how his numbers were so good. <laughs> <laughs> and when he, and when whoever pulls up those pro football reference pages 20 years from now, and you know, what kind of quarterback was this guy? They're going to go, man, wow, this guy put up some great numbers. And then like, why did they get rid of that guy and let him go to Atlanta? And uh, I'll never really be able to quite figure it out how – the, the seasons always went kind of the same way. The results were always kind of the same, but the numbers were reflective of, of like a top notch quarterback, but it wasn't ever really truly what we were seeing in front of our face. It's a, it's one of the strangest uh, phenomenons I think I've ever run across in sports. And you have to wonder like, how is this going to go in Atlanta for him now too? It's going to be really fascinating. I think it's, I think it'll be a little bit, more fun to kind of watch because you know as somebody who doesn't have like a rooting interest in the atlanta falcons it'll be easy for me to like watch it without having to have any sort of like frustration of like how how can kirk throw for 375 yards and four touchdowns with no picks and the falcons lose by three like how did that happen you know what i mean where we saw that so many times during the past six years where it was literally frustrating and to your point about just sort of the the ebbs and flows and the ups and downs where we just had so many moments where we were teased into thinking like this is gonna be it this is you know the the playoff win in new orleans that was i remember thinking wow bravo kirk cousins like played really well made a big time throw to adam thielen to set up the kyle rudolph touchdown in that game you're thinking okay well maybe this is year two with kirk here and maybe maybe this is they're going to turn the corner here. And if they go into San Francisco and lose, if, if but if they're really competitive, then you've got something that you've got something brewing, but then it just, like you say, you just get your, you get your face kicked in, you know what I mean? And so it's going to be fascinating to watch how this whole thing with Atlanta plays out because they're going to have a, a great opportunity. They're, they're in a very similar position that the Vikings were in when they signed Kirk Cousins six years ago, um, where they had, you know, really good talent on offense. They just were looking for that quarterback to just plug in and play and go. Um, so it's going to be fascinating to kind of watch how this sort of thing plays out in Atlanta. They've got a really good opportunity to have a, a nice season. I don't know if I'm ready to call them like a Super Bowl contender yet, but they're certainly going to be the favorites in that division, I think. And you know, they're going to have an opportunity to get a home playoff game and maybe make some noise. And if some things go their way, maybe they end up in the NFC title game. Who knows? But it's it's going to be fascinating to watch. And um, I think a lot easier to watch because I won't have a rooting interest in it. OK, I want to get into your evaluation and kind of grade of a lot of these moves that the Vikings have made. Uh, including your grade on them letting Kirk go, knowing, uh, though I think I have a, a pretty good idea what your grade is going to be for them not uh, extending Kirk Cousins. But I, I do want to ask you a little bit more about the Falcons thing. If the Falcons win with Kirk and go farther than they've ever gone with the Vikings, what should people think about that? Because I, I know what I think people should think about that, but I want to hear that from you. I think that ultimately, if if the if the Falcons like let's say you know maybe not this coming season but the twenty twenty five season they let's say everything comes together for them they go to the NFC Championship game and maybe they play a really tight game with you know San Francisco or somebody and they come up just short. I think what you do is you just you just tip your hat and you say okay good on you Kirk Cousins, congratulations. It was never ultimately was never going to happen here. You know, I, I kind of look at it the same way, you know, different players, different sport, but I kind of look at it the way, you know, when Andrew Wiggins got traded to the Golden State Warriors and they eventually won the title two years ago, beating the Boston Celtics in the finals. And Andrew Wiggins played really well in the finals. Like the Warriors do not win that title without 
his Dewalt without the way he played, especially in that game five, for them to go up three games to two. But, you know, the reality is it was never going to happen with the Timberwolves. You were never going to get, you know, Andrew Wiggins was never going to put the Wolves in a position to even, like, contend for a championship. It just was never going to work out. So ultimately, yeah, does it kind of suck if, as a Minnesota sports fan? Does it suck to see one of your former players go and win a championship with somebody else? We've seen it multiple times, you know, with with past you know, some of our past favorite athletes here. It's it's tough to see, but I think you you kind of recognize that it wasn't really going to happen here. And I think it's it's the same way with Kirk Cousins is that you can not like it and you can look back on it and wish, man, I wish it could have worked out better here. Wish, wish he could have gotten us to an NFC championship game, that type of thing. But I think ultimately you have to look at the way the last six years played out. And it was just, it just wasn't going to work. It just wasn't going to, you know, get the results that you wanted. And so I think you just, you just tip your hat to Kirk Cousins and the Atlanta Falcons if everything works out for him. And you just, you move on and, and you kind of focus on, okay, what do the Vikings need to do going forward to get themselves in a better position to, to contend for a championship? That's a great perspective, Manny, because my thought was very similar that if Kirk Cousins goes to Atlanta and succeeds, I don't think that it proves anything that we didn't already know about his right. time in Minnesota, which we always said what would have to happen for Cousins to win is you to build a behemoth roster that was reflective of what we've seen from Philadelphia or San Francisco. And then you would have to get the right matchups. And then you would have to have a lot of things go right for you. You kicker, they have a great kicker. Uh, your kicker makes every kick and your defense plays extremely well. You win the turnover battle. You have the ball bounce your way. You don't get very many injuries. And when we look at where the Vikings are or would have been had they signed Cousins, Building that roster around his cap hit was always really the trouble. I don't think anyone ever said it was impossible and we had seen him win a lot of games. It was always just the number of boxes you have to check if you have Josh Allen to be in the NFC or AFC championship versus the number of boxes you have to check with Kirk Cousins is different. If the yeah. Falcons are able to pull that off, congratulations to them. By the way, how did they get there? Oh, yeah. They haven't made the playoffs since 2017. They have consistently drafted in the top 10 Two, wait, no, three of their offensive weapons are top 10 draft picks. So not tanking, but tanking is essentially how they were able to build this team, which the Vikings were never willing to do. Uh, it just instead of tanking for a quarterback, it's almost like the lions did with Jared Goff, where they tanked around a quarterback uh, they, you know, the, for Jared Goff, where they end up getting all those top picks and those top players and the Falcons have kind of done that. So if they are able to do it and they're able to pull it off and Kirk wins, then I agree. Tip your hat to him. I wouldn't look back and go, wow, the Vikings failed there because the, the Falcons succeeded because the situations were just so much different. And also we evaluate things on the thinking at the time. So when we say the 2022 draft was bad at the time, it didn't make sense at yeah. the time that we were asked to evaluate drafting a safety and a linebacker and a guard with top picks. Then we went, okay, this, I don't get it. Like the trade back and not get a first round pick. That's first guessing with this. I, it would be second guessing. If, if you said, oh, well, the Vikings blew it because the Falcons won your first guess is what that, that it was the best move for the Vikings and that Kirk is probably going to go there, win a good number of games, put up a lot of points, lose in the first round. And then everyone will say, well, you know, he got him back to the playoffs. Maybe next year we'll get a new guard and then we'll do it all again. Or, I mean, I also it's possible. And this is part of the reason for the Vikings to move on that Kirk could get hurt again. We just mm -hmm. saw him tear an Achilles. So you never know when that's going to happen again. And there's one other thing I wanted to bring up with you. Uh, about the Falcons, which is, and William asks this, uh, says, uh, uh, has, have I addressed the tampering stuff? Um, and I have not mentioned the tampering issue with the Atlanta Falcons, that the NFL is investigating the Falcons tampering with Kirk Cousins, because I guess, and I didn't listen to his press conference because I don't have to anymore. 
uh, which is nice. So I didn't do that. I listened to Sam Darnold today instead. But uh, I guess that sort of the quiet part has been said out loud by the Falcons that they were always talking to him or whatever. And so the NFL is looking into that. I could not care about anything less, Manny. I mean, that's just, yeah. look, I, I go to the combine every single year and there are about four places around Indianapolis that are absolutely packed with NFL head coaches, executives, agents, et cetera. Former players are showing up there sometimes, uh, you know, looking for jobs or joining agencies or free agents. I, I saw NFL free agents showing up there looking to try to meet with teams and stuff like that. There is such a cluster of humanity in the NFL that goes there. And plus teams sit down with these agents as well. How would you ever police someone saying in a meeting with Mike McCartney about whatever other player you have of his, Hey, by the way, let's talk about Kirk for a few minutes. I mean, how, what, what are we going to record every meeting between agents and teams and, and all this stuff? Are we going to have Roger send NFL police into uh, <laughs> high velocity in, inside of the JW Marriott over there? I mean, what are we talking about here? So I would imagine Roger Goodell, uh, um, like most investigations, is sort of performatively investigating, will find that there was no tampering, and will all move on. And if he does find hard evidence, good luck with that, uh, that there was tampering, what, do they just take a draft pick away from the Falcons? Nobody cares about this. Do you care about this? I don't think anyone cares about this. I don't give a damn at all i mean and do, do we even know like are the vikings like filing a complaint with the league saying are the like are the vikings making some sort of outcry about this like what is what is what is the deal i mean i don't i don't really like the only way i would care about this is if you know if, if we'd find out that the vikings are going to get some sort of like compensatory pick or something like that like if they're going to get awarded like a second round pick because the Falcons tampered or like, you know, that whole thing. I don't know. Um, otherwise it's kind of a nothing burger to me. Like, I just don't think it really even deserves a lot of, a lot of time unless something really serious is going to go down, which when has that ever really happened? I remember I didn't when, when Favre signed with the Vikings, didn't the Packers try to file some sort of, or didn't they make some sort of complaint about, tampering or something from like the year before when they traded them to the jets and i i don't know I, it's just it's all just kind of dumb and unless something major is going to happen in in the way of like draft pick compensation then it doesn't really mean anything to me because then if that happens then you're really thinking about well you know maybe this is a extra ammunition for the vikings to trade up and take a quarterback in the top four who knows but that's not going to happen in terms of some sort of reward or something like that because the Falcons, you know, briefly spoke to Kirk Cousins during the combine. Maybe, I don't know. It just, I don't know. It just seems like a waste of time. What I think happened at the combine is uh, Mike McCartney put together all the medical things that he could come up with about this Achilles and he slid them under the door of the Falcons and they slid a note back with a number. And then it was knock twice. If you agree, I mean, it yeah, it doesn't matter. And Jared brings this up. Uh, are there any good reasons why tampering is still a thing? Why exactly? What exactly would be the difference if people were just allowed to talk whenever? Yeah, there is no difference because they can because they have cell phones. The, the whole tampering thing seems to be invented like many, many years ago where you weren't supposed to call up other players or try to recruit players to leave their teams and come to your team or whatever. But now that everybody can talk to everybody whenever they want, I see no reason to keep these things on the books. And I also think if there is a filed complaint by the Vikings, now they acted like they didn't care about this today in the press conference when they were asked, but if there was some sort of uh, bad blood, I guess with the Vikings toward the Falcons, maybe sound a little snarky uh, KOC at the combine. But even if that is the case, it would just be sour grapes. He ain't coming back. Like, it's not like they're yeah. going to void the contract because they, you know, uh, whispered and sent no. Do you like me? Circle yes if you do uh, at the NFL Combine. I, I don't think that was 
uh, that was ever going to happen. So let's go through these, Manny. I got to get your opinion on uh, all these things that have happened. We're playing catch up here, like old friends who haven't talked in, well, you know, a couple of weeks. Uh, we actually regularly talk, but uh, at least uh, these ha things hashed out. So I think we can just surmise. I wrote it down that you would give the um, Vikings letting Kirk go to Atlanta an A. Is that correct? Yes, I would give it an A plus. In fact, because I think. It's something that we talked about really <laughs> after Kirk Cousins got hurt. I mean, we really kind of talked about like, yeah, it's probably time to just move on and, and focus on finding that next young quarterback and and trying to rebuild and, and sort of replenish this roster. So give it a plus for me. Yeah, that one uh, has been discussed maybe at length. Although, you know what? Another thing about the Cousins era that it'll be defined by is how long we talked about him potentially leaving because he was negotiating contracts every couple of years. After 2019, I thought that Kirk Cousins was going to go after 2019 because that draft had so many good quarterbacks and turns out all of them turned out to be good in 2020. You know, from Joe Burrow to Tua to Herbert to uh, Jordan Love, so, like they've all turned out to be good. So, you know, there's that. But I thought because of that draft that there was a decent chance that he was going to leave after that and instead decided to stick around. And they actually signed him very early and then traded Stefan Diggs from out from under him. And that was also weird. It didn't seem to match up. Like, wait a minute, you're trading Stefan Diggs, his best wide receiver. You're letting all this talent go, but then you're signing him to an extension where the most, uh, the highest cap hit is in 2021, where you're actually probably going to be better and have developed some replacements. It did none of it, none of that ever added up. But every year it was like, is he staying? Could they trade him? They say, the number of times we've done episodes or articles, it was, should they trade him? Is he going to be extended? Uh, that was exhausting in itself every offseason. Uh, signing Sam Darnold, I actually have not spoken with you about this, so I am curious about your opinion of the Vikings choosing Sam Darnold as uh, their uh, Murph called it the spackle quarterback rather than the bridge, because it's kind of covering up a hole in the wall right now, but it is not a permanent solution. I like the spackle quarterback much more than the bridge. Uh, so your feelings on Sam Darnold, give that a, give that a grade. I'll give it a B plus. Um, I think I, I like the move because you know, there's there's an opportunity there for Sam Darnold to maybe, you know, revitalize his career a little bit, you know, get him in a situation where he's got some weapons to throw to an offensive minded head coach um, and, you know, just see what you can see, what you can get at out of him. And I also like it because it's not a long term commitment. And I think it also represents that this team is going to attempt to draft a quarterback in the first round you know, next month. And I think that's something that I've been pounding, pounding the table with my fist for, for, you know, dating all the way back to, to last season. So I, I like the move, you know, I, $10 million is a little much, I think for my liking, but I think ultimately you got to spend that money somewhere. So, you know, just it's, it's a one-year deal. I don't think it's, it's a super high risk sort of situation. Um, and Hey, let's see what Sam Darnold has. Let's see what he can do. And, uh, you know, I, I think it could be something that can work out for him. So I'll, I'll give it a solid B plus. I think of all the options and I made a list. I should go back and look at my list. Maybe I can find my list of the quarterbacks. Cause I do a, a series on the sub stack, go to purpleinsider.com newsletter comes out every day. There's going to be a mailbag that's going to take me 14 hours to answer every question, but I always answer every question. Uh, so go check that out. But I, I did a future of the Vikings series and I wrote down a bunch of names and he was there. And I'm going to try to pull this up here because I'm curious like who I included because this was a while ago for potential quarterbacks. All right, I've got this. Who did I include? Okay. I included uh, Kyler Murray, not happening. It's becoming right. very clear that's not happening. Mac Jones, that's going to be a no for me, dog. Yep. Uh, Baker Mayfield got way more money than I would have expected. So no, that wasn't a good choice. Gardner Minshew, how would you compare it to a Gardner Minshew? I probably would have preferred Gardner Minshew just from the standpoint of, I think he's, I mean, I think he's better than Sam Darnold. 
I know he didn't really have a great year with the Colts last year, but I think the the overall body of work has been obviously I think better than Sam Darnold. And you know, I think he can step into a situation and you know, you know, I think very similarly to Sam Darnold, you you know he's not going to come in and think that he's supposed to have a multi-year deal and be the team's long-term starter. I mean, he's he's, you know, I think even going into the situation in Vegas thinking, yeah, they could probably they they might draft a quarterback and if they don't draft one this year, they're probably going to draft one next year, so I'm just going to come in and be a professional, do my job and try to win as many games with this team as I possibly can. So, that's ultimately like in terms of like a bridge quarterback, that's what I'm looking for. Um, and I think, you know, Sam Darnold has a chance to, to be that as well. But I think if you're just talking in terms of which guy I would rather have between the two, it's probably Gardner Minshew because I, I tend to trust that he'll perform a little bit better. Um, but you know, I, I think, you know, Darnold was also cheaper because what did, what did Minshew get? He got two and 20, was it two and 25? From the Raiders, yeah, something like I that. Think. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Um, and maybe a little bit more guaranteed or around the same amount, but they under team control for two years. Minshew is so much more of a Ryan Fitzpatrick type yeah. than Darnold. And I think the difference is that there is this like finger quote upside where you still have to say it. It has not been totally decided that Sam Darnold is who he is, and he's not old enough to have totally decided. Gardner right. Minshew is who he is, but that is a decent starting quarterback that fills a spot for you. And we know that uh, there's a little bit more of guarantee on the box of what Gardner Minshew would give you as opposed to it's pretty erratic throughout Sam Darnold's career. And it could be erratic here. It could be, he looks great in training camp. It could be, he looks terrible. We just, like there's been a lot of different iterations of Sam Darnold uh, as he's gone along, there was the time in New York where they thought he was going to be the guy because he had some huge December and then came out the next year. And I think they won like two games or something. So, <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of those ups and downs where I feel like with Minshew, he's kind of been the same guy all the way through. Uh, Russell Wilson, that was a no for me. Were you out on that? Yep, totally out. I don't think it was a fit. I don't want to, I would not want to deal with everything that I think would come with Russell Wilson. Come here. He would be the probably the cheapest option because the Broncos are still paying him. And so you could probably sign him like the Steelers did to, you know, a, a veteran minimum contract. So money wise, it would make some sense. But just the overall sort of sideshow of him coming in and it's like, what is he going to do? The let's ride Vikings country kind of like what he did. I, I don't want to see any of that. And I just don't really know how much Russell Wilson really has left in the tank. And when you're talking about a bridge quarterback, you don't, you're not really thinking about like, you know, what is this guy going to look like three or four years from now? Cause it doesn't matter. You're not thinking about that far down the line with somebody like that, but he's also a guy that's trying to like, I think sort of repair his reputation a little bit and try to rejuvenate his career as like somebody's franchise quarterback. And I don't know if that's the type of guy you want, you know, when you're trying to draft a young guy to, you know, to develop and grow. I don't know if you want a guy like Russell Wilson who still thinks he's somebody's franchise quarterback going forward. I don't know if that's the best situation for a young guy behind him. You know, I think if the Vikings had a bunch of guys who were 32 years old and Kirk yeah. left them, even if they offered him whatever amount of money and you just needed somebody. And that's where he makes a lot of sense for Pittsburgh because they kind of do have that. They have a bunch of older players, Cameron Hayward, Minka Fitzpatrick, like their stars are not all that young. And Mike Tomlin really needs to win, needs to get into the playoffs, win around. So go for the best quarterback you could get at almost no price. The Vikings, I don't think are in that same spot. Plus you just can't put Russell Wilson with a young quarterback. That's just mm -hmm. not him. He is the show. He is the centerpiece. And look, I don't blame him. His career has earned that, but not who he's been recently, but try telling any pro athlete that, Hey, by the way, Michael Jordan, these aren't your wizards. Yeah. Right. Like he's, <laughs> you know, he's going to make them their team. So uh, I don't think it would have been a very good fit. I also think that O'Connell loves throwing the ball over the middle of the field, something Russell Wilson just does not do over his career. Mm -hmm. He's an outside the numbers thrower. So 
uh, Ryan Tannehill, Marcus Mariota, Tyrod Taylor, Jacoby Brissett, Carson Wentz. And that's the list. Anybody on that list that would have been a better option than Sam Darnold? Maybe J Jacoby Brissett. You know, Ish. I think there, there, yeah, there, there's, there's a, there's a track record there of him being, you know, pretty reliable and and playing well, and you know he's not going to come in at you know demanding to be the team's long term starter. Like he's a guy that I think would actually really want to help a young, you know, rookie quarterback that's that you're trying to develop. So I, I, you know, Jacoby, I think I would have been cool with the other guys. I mean. Tannehill, no, I don't think he really has much of anything left. And he kind of indicated a couple of years ago when I think was was it when they the Titans drafted Malik Willis that he basically wasn't interested in really helping Malik Willis grow and develop. And not sure. I mean, obviously, knowing what we know now about Malik Willis, it probably wouldn't have mattered. Um, but still, just I don't know if that's the kind of mindset you want from a guy, again, much like Russell Wilson. You want a guy that is going to be sort of a positive influence on on the young guy and i don't think ryan Tannehill would have been that okay that was a very deep breakdown of your b plus of sam darnold being the vikings <laughs> quarterback but uh yeah I, I give it i get high marks because i think he can be uh, that guy who is there for a younger quarterback as well as providing quality competition so and it seems like he's totally fine with that i mean he talked today about that possibility and just kind of said look I, i'm gonna work my hardest no matter what he proved that last year with Brock Purdy. And so we already have a sample size to say that that will be the case. Uh, Jonathan Grenard versus Daniil Hunter. It's not really a one versus one here. People will make it that as yeah. they let Hunter go to sign Grenard, but it's sort of Grenard plus the flexibility of Grenard's contract around the same amount of guaranteed money, two years versus four years. You could do a lot more with the salary cap over four years than two. Uh, and also the other players, which we'll get to that they were able to bring in. But I think as you grade them, you have to uh, simultaneously grade Jonathan Grenard joining and Daniil Hunter leaving. So what is the grade of, of that decision? Oh, that, you know, and in fact, when you put it that way, I had to think about it for a minute because, you know, I think if, if you're looking at the Grenard signing on, and in itself, I give it, I give it a solid a because He's a guy that's at a pretty good age. He was obviously very productive for the Texans last year. Very good pass rusher. Um, the PFF numbers are pretty good, you know. And you got him on a on a on a pretty pretty nice contract. And like you said, it's a four year deal, so it's a deal that you can kind of manipulate and and change around and restructure over the next couple of years if you need to. Um, but I think when you factor in the Daniel Hunter angle of this of Daniel Hunter leaving for nothing. That's where it, it kind of becomes like, eh, that might've been a mistake because they had an opportunity to, to move on from him, you know, during the season and they chose to hang on to him because they still wanted to try and make a run for the playoffs. And I know the players wanted to keep Daniel around the coaches did as well. Um, but you knew that this was going to be a possibility that he was going to walk for nothing if you didn't trade him. And that's exactly what happened. And so I think you have to factor that in. And so I think when you factor both of those things in, I'll give it a, I'll still give it a solid B because I do like the Grenard signing, but I think hanging on to Hunter without really much of a chance to, to retain him beyond the 2023 season, I think was a, was a big mistake in letting him walk for nothing. I agree that B is the right grade here because uh, Grenard can continue this uh, with his age. He does have some injury history. I don't think it's a disturbing injury history. It's like football players get hurt. I, I don't think it's Marcus Davenport level. I saw some comparison to that. I, I don't, I just don't agree uh, mm -hmm. more of along the lines of banged up a bit as opposed to, this guy has had so many injuries that he's missed so much time that it's hard to ever see him playing like a full season. No, Grenard is coming off a full season, tweaked an ankle at the end of the year, played 15 games. If he gives you 15 games, you're, you're pretty happy with that. But there is enough to downgrade it a little 
to say that if your answer to Daniil Hunter is someone with an injury history, we can bang that a little bit. Uh, you can't get an A plus for that. Um, and then the fact that they didn't get draft capital back for Hunter when we all could have seen it coming, that yep. they weren't going to make the playoffs after letting Kirk Cousins go. That also goes into this grade as well. Grenard is not the player that Daniil Hunter is. That is just a fact of the matter. There are very yep. few people who are. And I, I, I'll give him credit for this, though. He name dropped Chris Dolman today, talking about the history of uh, the Vikings and uh, edge rushers. So he does get a little upgraded for that, but you're losing a player who's great. And yeah. would anybody be surprised if Daniel Hunter is 35 and still gets 12, 13, 14 sacks. And part of it is because from the beginning, you didn't come in and sign him to a longer term extension, which now that we know the answer about his health, that he's been healthy the last two years, completely 17 games each of the last two years, then it's also a mistake to have not extended Hunter from the beginning when Kwesi Adafo Mensa and Kevin O'Connell got here. So it's more like a C plus because you don't have Daniil Hunter, you don't have a second round pick, and you do have a player who I think is good, but I do not put in the same category as a Daniil Hunter who is truly upper echelon in the NFL pass rusher. So I, I would go like C plus on that one, uh, maybe, maybe B minus, but I, I still think it's fine. And what the other players they were able to get factored in. But some of that stuff is with hindsight, you could look back and go, okay, we know that there were some mistakes there. And I'm not totally sure that Jonathan Grenard will just get 13 sacks every year because he's really only done it once. So that's another part of the factor as well. I think he's a really good player. Uh, how about these paired together? A couple of linebackers, Andrew Van Ginkle and uh, Blake Cashman and Vikings fans got their first look at Andrew Van Ginkle today and uh he went to wisconsin if you hadn't seen him there before long hair you know just uh his name is van ginkle i don't know he's just like this is a linebacker folks this is a linebacker a do-it-all linebacker who i really like and blake cashman i've never seen someone so excited to do their press conference with us he was having a great day minnesota guy went to the go first i mean just super super happy it was fun to see uh but how do you grade those two moves I like them both. Um, I'm going to give it an A minus and I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit with the Andrew Van Ginkle thing uh, because uh, I think it was about a month ago where we did a show and we talked about like if the Vikings just have unlimited resources, you know, if they're going to bring Kirk Cousins back and they've got unlimited resources with cap space, they're just going to spend, spend, spend. Who are you going to get? And Andrew Van Ginkle was one of the guys that I looked at and said, you know what? You look at his PFF grades, he's an edge rusher. He can, you know, he can get off the, you know, he can, you know, pressure the quarterback and things like that. And you probably would not have to break the bank to sign him, which the Vikings did not have to do. So I I love it. I thought it was a great signing. Blake Cashman, same thing. I, you know, he was really good for the Texans last year. Obviously the local connection, I think makes it even more exciting, but you know, he's a good player. I mean, Blake Cashman has really turned himself into um, a really, really solid NFL linebacker. And, you know, he's at kind of a, a nice age to both of these guys, you know, Ben Ginkle's a little bit on the older side. I think he's going to turn 29 this summer, but uh, Cashman 27, 28 years old um, with still, you know, maybe some room to, to get even better. You know, maybe we haven't seen the best out of him yet. And, Last year was really good with the Texans. So I like it. I, I'll give it a a, um, a, a solid A because I, I like both moves with, uh, with both guys. I do too. I think uh, both positions are pretty significantly upgraded. Uh, Van Ginkle is a much better player than DJ Wanham. All respect to what he took on last year, but he's been the definition of an average NFL player over his career. And Blake Cashman, even though it's a one-year breakout, um, if we're projecting forward, what is Jordan Hicks going to give you versus what Blake Cashman could give you? Cashman could give you, he's under contract for three, but uh, even more, you know, three to five more years of, of really good play. Whereas you know, Jordan Hicks, that, that would be betting on a guy who's really been through it body-wise, uh, was not as quick as he used to be. So these guys, I think, are real impact players. And if we're grading the fit, I think it's an A-plus fit for both of these guys. Uh, Cashman was a green dot at times in, in Houston, 
uh, it was a key part of D'Amico Ryan's defense. I think there's intelligence there uh, that, you know, Brian Flores is going to work with well. He moved around a little bit, but now he'll do more of that. He was a good pass rusher with the Gophers. I think they'll uh, use that more than he uh, did at the, the Texans. And then Van Ginkle, he was already used really well with Brian Flores. He was part of those Brian Flores defenses that went from worst in the league in 2019 to being an elite defense by 2021. And this guy was a big part of it. So he already knows Flores. He already knows how he operates. And we can look back at his exact performance and say, yeah, this is what he was in this defense and at a very reasonable price. I mean, I think it was 14 million fully guaranteed. That's hardly anything for a guy who can impact the game. To me, these were the best signings. These are the ones that I want to grade uh, the absolute highest. Now, was there anything else that, uh, that stuck out to you? I mean, I wrote this down. Brandel, Powell, Bullard, those guys coming back. Uh, someone named Trent Sherfield is now a Vikings. The bounce around receiver and uh, Jerry Tillery, who's not the answer at defensive tackle. I can tell you that. So I don't, I don't have any uh, others to grade, but how about this, Manny? Let me give you a hypothetical. Tell me how you would grade it. If the Vikings traded two first round picks, number 11 and next season, along with two second round picks to get the fourth overall selection, ensuring that they were going to get a quarterback in this draft, how would you grade that hypothetically? I'd give it an A. This is this is what I want them to do. You know, if you're if you're if you're telling me that JJ McCarthy is going to be there at 11. Maybe I wouldn't, you know, if you're going to guarantee me that J.J. McCarthy was going to be available with the 11th pick, I might not give it as high a grade because it's like, well, why don't you just keep keep the future assets and take the guy at 11? But McCarthy's going to go in the top 10, and you're going to have to contend for, you know, with some of these other teams maybe to get him or a Drake May. You know, maybe McCarthy goes number three and May would fall to you at four. Um if you do that and you get into that position to take a guy like this is, this is what I've been wanting them to do. This is, this is, this is it. You know, this is your chance. This is your opportunity to get that young quarterback and try and, uh, and, and really build a roster around him over the next, you know, three, four years. And think about this caller. You, you trade, you, you trade up, you get that young quarterback, whether it's may McCarthy, whoever think about, the the resources that they're gonna you know you're giving up draft picks but think about the resources they're gonna have in 2025 with all the cap space they're gonna have because the kirk cousins dead cap hit is off the books the daniel hunter dead cap hit is off the books you're in prime position to really do what you want to do to put this team together and and get yourself in position to contend so i if if they pull this off if they can move up and get a guy Really, really solid A for me. Yeah, I would feel the same way. I would feel like it was the connecting of the circle of where you started and or the painting of the picture. Did you ever watch the Bob Ross, uh, the PBS guy, those of us who grew up without cable, the painter dude, and he would start painting and you'd see it and you'd be like, I don't see a forest, man. What? Like, I just see a bunch of, (laughs) you know, random colors. And then he would bring it around And uh, by the end, he's got this beautiful painting and you're like, now I'm seeing it. And that's what it's kind of been like with this competitive rebuild, where at times you're going, I don't really see what the competitive rebuilding is here or of this move or that move. And even not trading someone like Hunter last year, like I'm not really seeing it. But if they were to trade all those draft picks to make sure that they got a quarterback then I would see it. Then it would be like, all right, you know what? In the micro view, some mistakes along the way, but in the macro view, now I see the entire picture. And uh, that's, that's what we're looking for is to really, by the end of this, understand what they were out uh, setting out to achieve and to see it come to fruition. If they were to not trade up, wait till 11, not pick a quarterback, take a defensive tackle, and then not trade back in for a quarterback or something. I'd be like, is Sam Darnold our quarterback here? (laughs) Like, uh, is that what we're doing? But, you know, I got no indication at the press conferences today that they think Sam Darnold is their quarterback. I mean, I think Kwesi Adafo Mensa described it as he's a quarterback under contract. I was like, wow. I mean, that's got to make you feel great. He's going to call his mom. Mom, 
the GM called me a quarterback under contract. I think it's going to work out here. Like there was no enthusiasm really whatsoever. So, you know, um, anyway, going back to the Kirk and Atlanta tampering thing, apparently Kirk in his press conference said that he had contacted the Falcons before he was a free agent officially. So he essentially incriminated himself for tampering, but again, I don't really care. And, uh, I am reminded by the chat that there was an actual tampering penalty handed down of a pick swap of the Arizona Cardinals and Philadelphia Eagles. So, um, yeah, we can look forward to some sort of majorly punitive thing. I'm sure coming down, uh, for the Minnesota Vikings, but maybe, maybe like, uh, uh who was it? Yeah, there was a good funny comment about your one 800 uh, tampering or something. Are you entitled to compensation? So <laughs> I guess the Vikings probably are, but I doubt it's anything that's going to change your opportunity to draft a quarterback. All right, let's uh, let's finish on this and then I'll, I'll spend a little time. I have to, I really have to write, uh, but I will spend a little time answering some questions from fans after you, you pop out many, but um, who do you like, man? Like, do you have a guy in the draft? I mean, we talked about it a little bit toward the end of the season, but the combine hadn't happened yet, things like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious as this whole thing is played out, if you have somebody that as you've learned more, you've read your tape analysis, you've watched YouTube highlights, combine interviews and so forth, uh, who you think would be the best fit for the Vikings? I think, I think Drake may would be the best fit. Um, you know, I know there's there's been some talk, especially like in the last week, week and a half, about you know some people being down on Drake May. I I still like him a lot. I still think he has a chance to be really good. You know, I think if you put him in a good situation with weapons, with an offensive minded head coach, um, you know, I think you, you're you're really going to give him an opportunity to have a lot of success. And oh, look at the Vikings; they have weapons and an offensive minded head coach who played the position himself. I mean, I think it would make a lot of sense if it's Drake may, if it's JJ McCarthy, you know, I've really, I've, I've warmed up to the idea of JJ McCarthy in the last couple of weeks, not just because he's shot up a lot of people's draft boards, but I think there's an opportunity, I think for him to, to have some success too. I, I think just my concern with him was just, he was, asked to do so little with Michigan from the standpoint of he was not asked to be very productive for them. Um, but I think there's something to be said for a guy to step in with a roster that, that that's that good with a lot of pressure riding on him, not just pressure on the head coach to win at a high level, but pressure on him as well to, to sort of lead the team and to run the offense um, and playing in a lot of big games, beating Ohio State twice, um, and you know, finding a way to to, to beat Alabama in the in the Rose Bowl, and then uh, doing enough in the national championship game. I think you know he seems like a high character guy. There is some talent there. Um, so if it's JJ McCarthy, I'd I'd be fine with that. But I think my first preference would probably be Drake May. With JJ McCarthy, and we've got time to talk about it a lot more heading up to no. the draft. But my 32nd thing on McCarthy is it's okay to have questions about a quarterback and also like the idea of drafting him. We yep. can do that. You don't, everyone doesn't have to act like they're Stephen A. Smith and Skip Bayless all the time with every opinion. It's one thing I like about our little group of fans that watch our show, Vikings fans, is that a lot of times they think in, in nuanced manners. And so I appreciate that about you see it in the questions and the comments and things like that. But so often it becomes, do you love that quarterback more than anything in your entire life? And you would throw yourself in front of a bus to save his life. Or would you rather push him in front of the bus? Cause you hate him. And it's like, that's just not how anything works though, because right. you can say, I'm a, I'm a little concerned about the fact that against Penn state, they had third and 10, they hand it off. Like that's, that happened. Uh, and, and also like, it wasn't very precise in some of the biggest games against Iowa or in the national championship game, there is accuracy issues. There is deep ball issues, but you can also say if they drafted him, you think it'd be a really good decision. And that goes for pretty much anyone. I mean, Drake may has some low lights that would make shacked in a fool, but yet at the same time, like 
I, yeah, the tools and everything else seem to fit really perfectly with Kevin O'Connell. So that's, that's just like, if you go for nuance, you often um, <laughs> miss the bus on, on hot takes and retweets and shares of your short video where you're screaming about one quarterback guaranteeing there'll be a bust or a success or whatever, but you end up looking silly. You end up saying that Desmond Ritter would be QB one, which I took the time today as I was waiting for a press conference to just search on Twitter, Desmond Ritter QB one to see which draft analysts were super high on a quarterback that had no discernible top end skill to me, but I've been wrong before too. So just to show you how wrong your favorite analyst can be when it comes to quarterbacks, which is why I'd be totally good with it if they drafted the guy they liked the most. So uh, where this all goes will be fascinating. I think the next move is though, trying to secure a trade up if that's what they want to do, unless they are sold on the second level of quarterbacks beyond those top four. Uh, all right. Final thoughts, Manny, a new wave, a new breath of fresh air. What is it called in star Wars? It's like a new generation and it's something. Are you not a star a, Wars a new, guy? Eh, lukewarm on star Ooh, Wars, a new, a new beginning, maybe new a new beginning, hope. a new yeah. hope, a new I hope. Think. Yeah, I think that's that's the that's title it. Of one that's of them, it. Yeah. Vikings post Kirk generation colon a new hope. Final thoughts. Yeah, of I, course. I'm, John, Jonathan just shoots me a text immediately, like he's been course, waiting the whole time just for any reference he could jump in on. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> um, I, I'm excited. I, I I I think this is this is what I I hoped that they would do. This is the route that I was pulling for them to do. Um, when the off season started and I couldn't, I couldn't be more thrilled. I, I like a lot of what they've done in free agency and, and now it seems like it feels like there's going to be a, a legitimate attempt to move up and secure that, that young quarterback and, and try to build on them and, and build on a, on a future. So I'm excited and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how everything sort of plays out. I, I wish the draft was like next week so that we could really find out what's going to happen, but we still have about a month and a half. So um, let the speculation begin and uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, you're the best, Manny. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time here. We'll definitely get together again as the off season goes along and big moves happen and absolutely after the NFL draft, probably before and after if uh, you're not too busy. So we'll make sure to grab you then. But thanks again for jumping on, man. And uh, we will talk football again very soon. Football. See everybody. Uh, I know a lot of you were asking for Manny's takes uh, over the last few days. So there you go. It did not disappoint as always. So here's what I'm uh, I got. I got about a half hour because I, I really I was at those press conferences today and the other night I said, oh, I'll answer like a couple questions and then I got to go write an article. And it ended up being two hours of answering your questions because you guys ask good ones and bring up great topics, but I get caught up in that. So half hour. So we'll go to 930 and then I got to go write an article and you should read it by going to purpleinsider.com, signing up for the newsletter. So let me scroll all the way back, all the way back uh, to earlier in the show from some of the comments here and respond. Uh, Rob says, what are your thoughts on KOC's body language at today's pressure presser? To me, he seemed a little bit reserved and lost. Uh, it was noticeable. And actually on the YouTube channel, uh, you're going to see uh, Dane Mizutani and I from earlier today, we recorded a podcast out at TCO Performance Center. And that was really at the center of the conversation is that Kevin O'Connell did not have the same type of energy that he usually does when talking about this team. And that took me by surprise a little bit. And I guess what I came away with for a conclusion is just that number one, he's kind of feeling it now. Like this is real now for all these other times that he's talked. It's always been probably in his mind that Kirk was going to come back that like, all right, he's, you know, he's playing around in free agencies or in that, right. But he'll come back here and he's going to run my offense and we're going to win and we're going to do everything we can to compete for a championship next year. And now it's like, oh, now we got to build a whole new thing. Kind of reminds me. So I like the house hunters shows and things like that. And if you ever watch Love It or List It, just stay with me. If you haven't, it's, you know, fairly entertaining. But uh, what always happens on Love It or List It is when they go to renovate the house, 
they always find something terrible wrong with the house. Every time it's, oh man, we got a foundation issue here. Oh man, we got leaking water every single time. And that's maybe what it was like for Kevin O'Connell. All right, we're going to do this renovation, but we're going to have Kirk and it'll be fine. Uh-oh, you got a foundation problem now. And ultimately by the end of the show, it's fixed up beautifully and cost the people more money. Uh, but in this case, that's kind of where the metaphor ends because there's an opportunity to build a better foundation over the coming years. But he just looked to me like a guy with a lot of weight on him right now because this quarterback decision comes down to him. It doesn't come down to Quasi Adafo Mensa or scouts or the owners or anybody else. It comes down to who the head coach really believes in. And he knows that it is a uphill battle to coach a rookie quarterback and to try to get the most out of them. Here's another thing he knows. If you pick the right guy, you can be known as a legendary coach. If you pick the wrong guy, you can be remembered as just another coach who got fired after three years. That's heavy stuff, man. That's your whole career resting in one off season, in one decision. Now it doesn't have to, and I don't think that it should always operate that way in the NFL, but we just know that's the reality of the NFL. How would you feel if that were the case? You'd probably you'd probably be feeling it a little bit, right? And it's, sometimes it's a lot easier for the general manager who's always wheeling and dealing with players to say, all right, that's not his price. He's out. Next guy's in better price. Draft a guy. It's fine. Go ahead. But Kevin O'Connell is really the one that's wearing the weight of the world on his shoulders here. So I think that overall O'Connell does kind of show his emotions on his sleeve sometimes. And uh, I think we saw that a little bit today, um, but also, it, you know, he might just be tired. Like it's, it's just hard to, draw all these distinct conclusions, but I, those who watched the press conference would have said, yeah, it's not his usual sort of up, like, you know, tempo kind of excitedness that we have generally heard from him, even when talking about some things that, that weren't the best or that they were going to have to overcome. Uh, what about Bob says, uh, do you have any steam on uh, is steam? What we're using now since the Justin Jefferson nonsense, uh, on what teams are willing to trade at the top of the draft. I don't know. I mean, Arizona just makes so much sense, but they also make so much sense for Marvin Harrison jr. Or Malik neighbors or whoever Arizona wants to pair with Kyler Murray. Their goal should be to get the best wide receiver they can. So their price will not be nothing, right? It's It's going to be significant, very, very significant. And there's everybody's calling them new England after getting Jacoby Brissett just does not look like a team that's going to pick anything else but quarterback at number three overall. That's just my read on it right now. And the same thing goes for Washington. They bring in, uh, what Mariota and they trade away Sam Howell. Like that team is setting up, lining up to draft a quarterback with the number two overall pick. Same thing going for number three, but number four, if there's anything that's going to be up for sale, it's going to be that. And that just is common sense. Right. Uh, but I, I haven't like steam. I, have I seen any, you know, Adam Schefter rumor? Have I seen the Cardinals put it out there intentionally only when they tweeted out the Kyler Murray thing, they tweeted out that Kyler Murray was their franchise quarterback, which may have been a wink, wink, nod, nod. We are open for business because we're not moving Kyler Murray. So if you'd like, <laughs> go ahead and send us your trade proposal. Uh, from Mike, do you think that there is anything to the rumors that fields isn't in play because the bears are shopping the number one overall pick? No, I don't. I think that fields isn't in play because fields is bad. That's why that's what I think it is. I think he's just not a good quarterback and there's no evidence to suggest that he is. Bears fans will lose their mind when you tell them there isn't, but truly there's not. If you compare Justin Fields to Sam Darnold with the New York Jets. Tell me how it's different. <laughs> I mean, I tell tell me honestly how it's different. Uh, it's not. They are just failed first round draft picks, and teams are usually not willing to spend that much on failed first round draft picks unless they think there's something else there. But you have to build everything around that player. There's only one real spot that makes sense to me 
for Justin Fields. And that's as Jalen Hurts' backup. Because if Jalen Hurts got injured, then you could run the same stuff. But he's got to go to a place where it's a run first quarterback situation because he's not a great passer. And I won't believe he is until I see it. You know, I really won't. Like he's got to show it. And it's been three years and he's never shown it. He's an occasionally good passer, but mostly very bad. And they've built it all around their running game. How many teams have quarterbacks where the situation is built around the quarterback running first? Even historically, very little, very few. Usually it's pass first, and then you build off that with the running game. Even with Lamar Jackson, he's still throwing for a thousand more yards than Justin Fields did last year. Uh, groovy skeptic. Is there anything to Quasi's? We don't have to draft a quarterback, or do you think that's a function of holding their cards close to the chest? It's one of those things you just have to say. If you say, oh yeah, buddy, we're drafting a quarterback. Well, I don't think that changes anything as far as their leverage goes. I just think that it's not something you would generally reveal to the world, but everybody knows if they said it, that would be totally fine. And I don't think any of us would criticize Quasi Adafalmensa for saying that, but I think he's trying to at least be a little like, oh, you know, maybe we don't have to. We like Sam Darnold a lot. We could just stick with him this year, but that's just silly. I mean, that's not the plan. The plan is to draft quarterback and anything else would not make any sense at all. Brett, Van Ginkle and Cashman both seem like Jack, uh, Jack knives or, uh, Jack of all trades, uh, perfect for Flores' system. I think they will be excellent with flow coaching them. The fact that we already know Van Ginkle was excellent with Flores coaching him is pretty good. Like that's a pretty good signing. If you can get someone where you already know the results, you don't have to try to project. You could just go right back and see exactly, uh, what, you know, um, what he did before. Oh, you know what? Uh, Jordan says, did Manny grade Aaron Jones? You know what? We forgot about that. We got caught up on some other conversation going through all those uh, potential quarterbacks, and I did not get his grade on that. Sorry about that. I mean, for me, that's an A because it's a one-year deal, and he could significantly upgrade the running game in the first year of whatever you're doing quarterback-wise. If it was anything more than a one-year deal, I'd be like, yeah, I don't know, but I don't know how you could go anything less than an A unless you're concerned about his injury history. Maybe you could go, let's, let's not get crazy. Let's go, let's go B plus because of that, because there is injury history there recently for Aaron Jones. He is such a great player though. Uh, from what he did last year, I mean, his most recent performance is kind of legendary for what he did at the end of the season and into the playoffs. Dave says, I like their moves in free agency. If they bolster the defense and offensive line and running game, then Sam Darnold should be fine as a bridge. The key is what the GM finally having a successful draft. Yeah, I mean, it's really, at least if it's going the way that I think it's going to go, then it's about the head coach picking his quarterback and then finding enough other pieces later on in the draft that can eventually develop into something. But it's mostly going to be how they deal with free agency to build the other parts of the roster. This draft is really the draft of the quarterback. And it might take multiple picks. It might be the only guy you get in the first two days, but it is the draft of the quarterback. As long as you get him, I would not, I'd put it on the whole regime. And when you draft a quarterback, it goes on everybody. It goes on the owner, the coach, the uh, general manager, the whole organization. If you draft Lewis Seen, I'll just put that on (laughs) Quasi. Right, the trade down, I'll just put that on him. That That was his stuff. But, we're talking about a quarterback. Okay. That's everybody. They all have to be in quote alignment, which they said that they were today. So they always do say that though. I've never heard anyone be like, no alignment. No, we're not on the same. Maybe Zimmer would have said that if we ever asked him, are you on the same page with uh, Rick Spielman? No, no, <laughs> that wouldn't have been the case. Uh, Seven dragons asked, what would you guys think of signing Xavier and Howard? I'd be okay with it, but his last two years have been pretty underwhelming. One of the problems with, corners is that, uh, that they get to a certain point where they hit their peak and it's very short. Normally that there's not a lot of corners who have a super long peak edge rushers. Now this is, this is kind of an argument maybe to draft edge rushers and not corners because edge rushers can have a 10 year peak 
They could be great for year after year after year after year. Where corners, they start off, they're a little spotty. And then if they're really good, they'll hit that two or three year window where they're great. And then they, uh, you know, eventually uh, fall off. And that's what's happened to Xavier and Howard. Now, if Brian Flores thinks it was system related, then I'm into it. It's really all his decision. He would be an upgrade, but for a very short time, I think he's like 32 years old. Just for a very short time, it would be an upgrade. I'd prefer they go after someone a little bit earlier or younger, younger, I should say. Hunter says, uh, should the Vikings try to copy the 2012 Washington model and draft two quarterbacks in the same year as a contingency, something like McCarthy in the first and Jordan Travis in the fourth? Yeah, that is a a model that has not often been tried (laughs) for sure. Although San Francisco picked Brock Purdy as well. Now that was the what following year of, of Trey Lance. And maybe they already had hints about Trey Lance, but normally you would have said, well, they've got their quarterback. Why would they pick another one? Oh, it's the seventh round. Who cares? Look, I would never criticize a team for doing that. If they did, I would never criticize it. I think most of the time you are throwing away your draft pick though. If you draft a quarterback in the middle rounds, we've seen that recently. You kind of, I mean, okay, you got Purdy, you got Dak Prescott, you got Kirk, you got Russell Wilson. It's not a huge sample versus how many quarterbacks have been drafted in the middle and late rounds that have actually worked. I'd probably rather just go with, you know, I don't know, a, a defensive tackle or a guard or something. That's my preference. But if they did that, and they took the guy with the ACL injury because he might have some upside. I'm not going to say that's wrong, but I also think that it played games with RG three in Washington. We could say, well, they nailed it. Kirk got them to the playoffs one year and was a better quarterback than RG three. And that is true. But I think it also from that very beginning kind of split people where the Shanahan's clearly liked Kirk. They're very big Kirk people and RG three, you know, maybe you start to like the other guy a little bit more and everything. And RG three's knee injury is what really ruined his career. But you know, there, there became, it became like a thing with the two quarterbacks. And I don't know if you exactly want that to happen, but again, I'm I'm not going to be against it. Uh, How much uh, Brandon says, how much better is Sam Darnold as a quarterback than Nick Mullins? He is way more naturally gifted and still potentially on the upswing. But how much actually better of them playing? It's not much. And it's weird how quarterback works that way because if you could combine the two, if they could go in the cryo chamber or whatever and be fused where you could put the Sam Darnold arm and chest and all that stuff, muscles and everything, he's he's a big guy, uh, onto uh, Nick Mullins, uh, I'd be a superstar, but it's not how it works, unfortunately. So they do it in different ways and they get to basically the same place, which is far too many turnovers. You know, uh, they take a lot of risks. They get some big plays. They get some big games. Sam Darnold is clearly way, way more gifted than Nick Mullins, but the statistics of them starting don't look all that different. So, I mean, backups are backups. That's usually how it ends up going. But I think Darnold is somebody that you could start over a full season physically. I don't know if you can start Nick Mullins over a whole season. Uh, that it seems kind of dangerous actually <laughs> to start Nick Mullins over an entire year. Cause he does have a tendency to get himself killed. Uh, he gets hit. He takes hard hits. He throws so many interceptions. Uh, he might pass Jameis Winston's 30 interceptions. If you had him start an entire season, whereas Sam Darnold, uh, will make mistakes and will turn the ball over, take sacks and fumble and you know, throw picks, but he could start a full season and give you a chance to make the playoffs. I don't think that's the case with Mullins. Mullins is like five and 19 or something as a career starter. So he, yeah, I'd say I mean, Darnold is significantly more talented as a quarterback than Mullins. Uh, Brett says, why has uh, Minnesota not offered Dalton Reisner a contract? Why is Reisner basically panhandling for a job on Twitter? Is there something unforeseen to the public that management doesn't like about him? Uh, no, I, I mean, I think it's more just pretty simple what we think it is, which is they brought in Reisner last year 
because they wanted a little more grit from that position, I think. And they wanted a little better pass protection. They wanted a smarter guy as far as identifying blitzes and twists and stunts. And they got that. I mean, he is really good as a pass protector, but if you're getting Aaron Jones and your main goal is to improve your running game, you're just not bringing back Dalton Reisner. And if you can name me a team in the NFL that wants a guard that doesn't run block effectively, and we're talking very bottom of the league and, and is going to pay top notch dollar for it. I mean, I, there's just not many. Um, Reisner is a really enthusiastic teammate, always there at his locker, ready to answer for whatever happened in the game and all that, and runs up to his teammates and picks them up when they go down and all those things and became a very likable figure for the Vikings last season. It's just, you just brought in one of the best running backs of the last decade and you want to run the football effectively. So you're going to bring in the guy who ranks like 60th out of 70 guards in run blocking over the last five years. It's been a trend with him that I think is the hold up, and he's just probably not getting a whole lot of attention because of that. And if you're him, that's tough because pass blocking is really important. It really is. It's really important. And so he's got a good argument for, Hey guys, come on. I'm really good at this. You know, like, shouldn't you pay me some money for being good at this? But sometimes weaknesses are what ultimately get you with offensive linemen. Uh, Taylor says we talk about quarterback a lot. That's true. Well, yes, we do. On the week that Kirk cousins leaves, we certainly do. Uh, biggest needs beside that, uh, cornerback and nose tackle are the closest for me. I, think that left guard is probably my place to begin. Defensive tackle is still Jonathan Buller, Jerry Tillery, Harrison Phillips, not good enough. Absolutely not good enough. They need defensive tackle, left guard. Cornerback is definitely a need. Um, if we were ranking the one thing, if it got left off that you'd be like, okay, I guess it's probably corner is the one thing. And that's not saying that I disagree with you. It's just that if you were to leave that off, uh, oh, Keenan Allen is signing with the Bears, huh? Yeah. Wow, that just happened. Well, that's not good for the Vikings. <laughs> that guy, what did he do to them last year? And that's probably why the Bears signed him. He roasted the hell out of the Vikings like nobody I've ever seen before. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. Caleb Williams possibly gets a pretty good weapon there. Or whoever they pick. Maybe it's Jaden Daniels. I don't know. Whoever it is, they're going to throw the ball to Keenan Allen against the Vikings 40 times. So anyway, uh, corner corner because they have Evans, they have Booth. They could bring in somebody else uh, like a Levi Wallace. We've seen this before where average corners for their career sometimes you know have solid seasons and solidify a unit even if you don't have a shutdown guy. So it's still important, but that defensive tackle and left guard to me are are way up at the top because center and right guard are shaky. So if you can have a very good left guard, quality left guard, average center, still I'm not convinced on the right guard, two great tackles, you can have a pretty good uh, overall offensive line, I think. Uh, Ty D. Skull says, we should not just draft a quarterback because we feel like we have to. We all know what happened the last time we drafted a quarterback too early based on need. I'll leave it at that. Won't say his name. You know, the drafting of the quarterback thing, and I know that Christian Ponder has hurt you all. I understand that. But also, uh, there is so little rhyme or reason to who succeeds or fails when it comes to drafting quarterbacks that both of the top quarterbacks last year, there were rumors that both of them had their owners step in and force them to make the pick. One of them was Bryce Young. The other one was CJ Stroud. In one case, the Carolina Panthers look foolish. In the other case, the Texans look genius. And in both cases, the owners seem to just step in and demand that they do it. Uh, because it is so difficult to project, Christian Ponder had every bit the chance of anybody else who was a first-round pick to work out. He just didn't. And if he did, then the Vikings probably would have been really darn good if he had worked out. I would defend a pick like that. He was a good athlete pretty good quarterback, uh, in college. So, all right, take your guy. It didn't work out. You know what they did two years later, they took another guy. Was it two years? Uh, they took another guy and, uh, that guy got them to a division title and his knee blew out, but still, 
you can't be you can't be afraid. You can't be afraid. And I don't think that Christian Ponder ever proves anything about anything. Period. He doesn't prove that you shouldn't do X, Y, or Z. He doesn't prove that Rick Spielman didn't know quarterbacks. He doesn't prove that Mike Mayock was a genius because he said on draft night that you know it was a reach. He doesn't prove anything. All it's just sometimes these quarterbacks don't work out. And if they draft one that doesn't work out, it will be bad for the franchise. I think we all know that. But they're going to give that player the best possible chance to succeed. We'd never really ask if they gave Ponder the best chance to succeed because he was so bad. But, you know, did they? Like, did they have receivers then? Did they? They had the running game, obviously. Did they have the coaching then? I don't know. Like, but they're going to push this decision in the best way they can with what they have around this quarterback that they draft. So uh, I, I don't think that a failed draft pick for, for many, many years ago should have any impact on how you look at this. Um, yeah. Uh, one before I die says with Wanham now signing a deal, are the Vikings lined up to get a comp pick? Uh, you guys love the comp picks. Um, I never really pay much attention to them because they announce it <laughs> the next year, but I, and then I'm not making fun of you. It just tells me how obsessed you guys are with uh, football, which I love. But it's something that since they just announced the list before the draft, I usually just wait until then and don't think about it. Uh, but the way that it works with comp picks is they get counteracted by signings that you make. So I would guess that because the Vikings are making big signings, that they are not going to... Um, end up getting much compensation for what they've lost. So they lose Kirk, but they bring in Darnold. Maybe there's some gap there because Kirk's contract was so big. Lose Hunter, bring in Gennard, bring in Van Ginkle. There's a whole secret whatever formula to figure that stuff out. But most of the time, uh, most of the time, you don't end up getting a whole heck of a lot if you end up spending in free agency, which the Vikings have. <laughs> Oh man, you know, uh, yeah, the, the, the ponder thing is something that I, I just feel like because the Vikings have tried so few times is the reason that it comes up because they have not taken the top 10 quarterback because they have so often tried to fill the spot with Brett Favre, which worked or with you know, whatever, Matt Castle or whatever guy that they could sort of find uh, that that's and stuck with Kirk Cousins for so long. That's why there's so much focus on one guy who failed, but you could go through any franchise and they've got failed quarterbacks. Every franchise has them for the most part, um, except for what Green Bay and Indianapolis, like everybody else has made mistakes in the draft. And that doesn't say anything to, uh, you know, about what's going to happen in the future, especially something that we're talking about is a dozen years old. Uh, and draft analysis has gotten better. Quarterbacking has gotten better. Coaching has gotten better. Offenses have gotten easier to run. Uh, the wide receivers are good. I mean, so look, you're never going to be perfect though. You're never going to be perfect, but they should pick uh, uh, with somebody who they think really matches well personality wise with their coach. That's the biggest thing. You're always trying to say, I guess if you were to look back at Ponder and say, what, what was it? Was it the desperation to draft a quarterback? I, I'm not, I don't know about that. And reaching on a quarterback's fine to me too, for the most part, like, oh, well, he's only the 18th best player. Well, quarterbacks are always the top. If it's worth a first round pick, then it's worth it. But what, what was it? Um, was it the supporting cast? I mean, I know for Ponder that he has said, and it might just be that they misevaluated his talent. Usually they don't misevaluate the talent. Normally what happens is it's about the way the player mentally and emotionally reacts to his environment. And was his environment the same as the environment they're going to give JJ McCarthy or Drake may. So, you know, there's that, but yeah, I mean, we can move, we can move on Th things. We need to make a list someday of things you can move on from. The Herschel Walker trade, like move on. It's it's all right. It, it's a long time ago. There's no reason to talk about that anymore. Or uh, the same with with uh, Christian Ponder. But yeah, the the Keenan Allen trade. Some of you guys bringing that up. That wow, that's a great trade for the Bears. 
The Vikings are now dealing with some very intelligent front offices that they're going to battle against. So they're in the right way with a lot of the things they're doing. They're in the right mindset. They're taking the right approach. But the Bears over the last two years now, since the Chase Claypool trade, which is one of the worst you'll ever see, since then, man, they've done a lot of good stuff. And uh, the Vikings have to be in the position to do things like this at some point, which they can. Because, uh, you know, Keenan Allen is a really, really good wide receiver. And he's going to go with DJ Moore there. And that's a big upgrade from Darnell Mooney, who I don't think is very good. So, whew, this, man, this is exciting. NFC North's exciting. They're watching these rebuilds. And now the Vikings coming along as well is uh, over the next few years going to be really something. So, all right. Great stuff, guys. Great stuff. And uh, shout out to Manny. Uh, one of my best friends. He's just... Uh, so great at contextualizing it all and giving his uh, perspective. So i um, glad you guys enjoyed seeing Manny back on the show. If you're new to the show uh, during the regular season, Manny and I are on here every Monday and Thursday, breaking down the week's game. So thank you guys so much up on the, the channel. Next is Dane Mizutani and I from TCO performance center uh, with maybe um, worse lighting out there <laughs> in the little side room. But uh, yeah, we did it right after the, the press conferences. So keep your eye on the channel. That video is going to premiere coming up next. So thanks everybody so much for the discussion. This was really fun as always, and much, much more to come. Emergency podcast with every move articles over purpleinsider.com. So keep your eyes out and we will talk very soon. Football.